All right, so this afternoon I'm chatting to Mandy Olafi from Saika. I'm going to let her introduce herself so she can explain exactly what she does. But from, from my perspective, Mandy, I'm, I'm so grateful that you've made time to, to chat to us. And I think it's absolutely high time that students start getting information directly from the source. You know, everyone talks about what Saika wants, <laughs> what Saika expects, and, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, let's, let's, go straight to, let's go straight to the source and make sure that students are making decisions based on what Psych actually says. <laughs> Excellent. So welcome. Okay. Thank you. Great. Yvonne, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. And it's always a pleasure to chat to you and, of course, your students. Um, and so let me start, as Yvonne said, she'd like me to introduce myself. Yeah. Um, I work... At Saika, I am a senior executive, um, and I'm responsible for the pre-qualification process. What does that mean? Basically, in a nutshell, I look after everything from the academic program when you start your studies as a student, right. through to when you complete your training program, um, as well as the two professional examinations. Okay. So that's everything in a nutshell. Up to the point of those four letters. <laughs> Everything up to there. Okay, so um, the discussion that that we're going to focus on today, and, and I hope it's 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 the first of, of many with with different people at Saika, is the future of the qualification process. I think people are talking a lot about the future of the profession, the future of, and that's that's great, and that's 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 a different topic for now. But um, Saika's got some some really interesting plans as far as the qualification process is concerned for the future and that's something that students really need to understand because I think to some extent it's already impacting their studies. They can already see changes coming through in their exams and this I think will help them understand where those come from. And Saika calls this CA2025. I'm not sure how many students have, have heard of this <laughs> but uh, but it's there and 2025 is not actually that far away. So what is CA 2025 and why the change? Great. Um, you ask a very good question um, and you said it uh, quite correctly. 2025 is not that far away. No. Um, and um, in fact, uh, I'm not sure why we chose that name other than in 2016 when we started this project, 2025 sounded like far away. <laughs> Um, and uh, it's, it's a hell of a lot closer now. So, yeah. so um, the project uh, really was uh, named that to represent uh, two things. One, it was to represent what the chartered accountant uh, would look like. And the 2025 is simply to represent in the future. Right. And the reality is that in our profession, things are changing all the time. They have always changed. Yes. This is not just like suddenly we work up and now you know technology and the fourth industrial revolution is yeah. here now suddenly we all have to jump around um i think if you look at the profession and you can go back 25 years 50 years you know as a profession that's one of the things we do you know that's why we belong to this profession we evolve on mm. an ongoing basis and i think mm. the changes that you, that the students may have been seeing in the exams are probably more reflection of that ongoing change rather than directly okay. attributable to CA 2025, the specific project, although um, a lot of what's contained in that project will see itself um, uh, manifested much deeper um, and more evident, if I can put mm. it that way, mm. um, going into, into the future. So in essence, what we did, um, as I said, back in 2016, we realized that in order for accountants to remain relevant into the future, what we needed to look at and do was to define what competencies chartered accountants needed to, to be able to demonstrate. Um, and we choose the point of entry into the profession as the easiest point to define because that is when people are still the most common. So everybody goes through the same undergraduate, right. yeah. same postgraduate, yeah. everyone writes the same ITC. Mm. Yes, the training program context and environment is different because you can be positioned um, in a big four firm, mm -hmm. in a small firm, uh, in corporate, practice, yeah. you could be in public sector, you could be in corporate. And that's the idea. 
And that's what I guess has been growing over time is the shift away from audit to being able to gain your experience in any kind of environment. And I think right. the CA 2025, what you'll see, it starts to embrace that even more. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the research project has been fantastic. What we've done, we've done formal research. We have um, used a combination of uh, methods to, to get that. So it really is solid a piece of work that's been done and it would be very hard I think to challenge some of the aspects in that framework because of the extent of the research yeah. that has been done. Yeah. Um, from desktop research to focus groups to one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews and of course one of the things we've done is compared ourselves to what other accounting yeah. bodies are doing in the world yeah. um, and I think you know it's really clear that as as the South Africa in the South African context we really do lead in this respect right um, and we see others uh, following us um, in suit okay. um, and in fact some of the professional bodies are still very much knowledge-based in terms mm. of their curricula mm. whereas we have shifted already back in 2009 to a competence-based uh, approach yeah so yeah. that, in a nutshell, a um, very long nutshell, uh, <laughs> is what the CA 2025 project um, is all about. Um, and if you'll allow me, Yvonne, just yeah. then say, you know, so what, why did we change this? And I want to just yeah. make something very clear, because everybody seems to think that we are making this change because of the fourth industrial revolution and because right. of the impact these new technologies are going to have on business. Right. But I would like to say that is one element mm. of why we are making these changes. There are a number of other factors that I think impact the roles of accountants. Mm. And they would include things like geopolitical factors, climate change, urbanization, um, the different and uh, expectations of the workforce of the future. You know, all of these things really change the way we think about accountants and the role that accountants play in society. Um, and that is really what's, what's fundamentally changed. I can go into the details um, a little bit later. Yeah. So, you know, please just to be absolutely clear, it's not, just... it's not only about the technology. Yeah. Yes, that's a, a large driver and you'll see that's one of the big changes, but there are other, other things. And so the role okay. the accountant plays is far broader than just drafting a set of financial statements. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think it's, it's difficult as a student when you're in the class and you're studying and you're just talking to other students to really understand where this stuff filters down. So, you know, like you say, it's going to be hard to challenge this stuff, but when you understand the thought processes behind it, then you go, okay, it may be difficult, it may be challenging or may not like it, <laughs> but I understand, you know, understand where it comes from. So if I'm studying my PGDA now, for example, and yeah. I go six, seven years into the future after CA 2025, would I recognize the qualification process? I mean, how drastically, how drastically is this going to practically impact people on the ground for a student studying? Are they actually really going to feel the difference in their syllabus, their subjects, exams? Is it really going to be noticeable for them? Yeah. So I think, you know, the thing that is going to stay the same, if I can put it that way, is the elements of the qualification process. So there are right. three key elements. There's an academic component. Mm. There is a practical experience. That's a training program requirement. Yeah. And then there's the professional exam. So the, those three things are, are you will always see. That's not going anywhere. What is going to change is the curriculum itself. Right. And I'm not sure that we're going to see necessarily overnight today, last year, the accounting program mm. was like this in first year, next year, now it's completely mm. different. What we're going to see, start to see is a series of stepped up changes. So, and this is in line, I think, with the fact that change occurs on an ongoing basis. And even as we stand today, things will con continue mm. to change mm. into yeah. the future. Yeah. So what you'll start to see is, is smaller changes, I think, at first, um, which over time, if you look back, you'll say, oh, gosh, if you put that all together, that was yeah. quite a significant okay. change. So I think okay. that's, that's, you know, what we're going to see. You're going to see changes in two, in two ways. One, I think there's going to be a big shift in the way um, the programs are delivered. Okay. And this is not about COVID and going online. This is about the teaching and learning approaches that are needed to develop 
competencies. In other words, this is not about just um, people knowing the accounting knowledge. It's about them having the skills, and I'll talk about some of those skills, to actually apply that knowledge. Okay, right. so that's why the teaching and learning approach okay. needs to change. Yeah. Um, and I guess students at university already, what they may have seen is, uh, for example, uh, projects that cross disciplines um, is a, is right. a common common yeah. one that would be something that um, is a change from say four or five years ago mm, so, mm. so that we'll start to see and then I think you will also start to see changes in in the components of the program um, you will definitely start to see more um, digital acumen uh, mm. type courses uh, being in, included in the program but also integrated into what we would typically know the core subjects uh, to right. be Okay. The, the, the digital IT stuff, you will definitely see a change. Right. And it's quite bizarre because when I studied, and I'm not going to tell anyone when that was because it was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but I had to do um, a specific um, IT course and a lot of universities have, have taken that out of their uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, okay. yeah. So a lot of them are going to obviously start uh, start adding them back. Right. Not everyone, but but some They're of them. Gonna, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. you'll definitely start to see that as well as how RT is integrated mm. uh, into each of the disciplines. Okay. That would be the one big change. The other shift I think that people will start to see is the context within, and I think I referred to it just now, what is the role accountants have to play in society? Um, and, you know, I think we always saw ourselves as um, stewards and uh, creators of um, financial statements. In other mm -hmm. words, talking directly to financial data only. Yes. It is very clear that in the context of the new framework, um, we use the, the, the following terms. We're looking to develop responsible leaders, okay, who behave ethically, very important given the hmm. recent scandals, and I think we will continue to see some uh, accounting scandals, yeah. um, but really to bring back that core that accountants need to behave ethically. And yeah. behaving ethically needs a much broader understanding than just this is the code of professional conduct. It really does need to be, yeah. to be much broader yeah. than that. So we're looking to develop responsible leaders who behave ethically, um, towards a broad range of stakeholders. Mm. In other words, we're no longer just thinking about, you know, the shareholders of this co company and we're only mm. uh, directed and committed to serving that stakeholder group. Right. The stakeholder groups, groupings are broader. going to have to be far broader um, mm. and may ultimately include the public at large. You know, if you're a company that's um, emitting toxic gases mm. into the air, uh, you know, those are the kind of, you know, that affects the broader public. Those mm -hmm. are the kind of stakeholders that accountants in the future are also going to need to consider. So okay. a much broader range range of stakeholders. Um, and this is also uh, to, to look at both financial and non-financial mm -hmm. data. Right. And then this is where we get to talk about integrated reporting, uh, integrated thinking, mm -hmm. and the need really to balance um, what we're calling the professional skills with enabling competencies and the technical skills. Right. So there's, there's some base technical knowledge which will still be required yeah. and which we will define. But the reality is in the world today, there's so much knowledge we can't possibly know it all. So we're actually going to pay back a little yeah. bit on the knowledge side, right. okay? Right. Because we believe you must be a lifelong learner. That knowledge, yeah. you yeah. must know how to learn it post-qualification. Because right. it's going to change all the time. That's great. Yeah. Those are the keys. So for for students, can we can you explain the difference between um, technical knowledge and a competency? I think competency is a word that we as academics and you know we're comfortable with that. But I think students are not quite like what's the difference? You know, what's the difference between a competency the way you talk about it and technical knowledge? Yeah. So when we use the term competency, we refer to um, knowledge and skills and attitudes and behaviors. And if you think about this logically and the, some of the counting scandals we've seen, I bet you could ask any of those people to qu quote the code of professional conduct. And I can do it. The knowledge part yeah. of it. <laughs> right. yeah. I'm sure they'll be able to tell you what the knowledge is, okay? Right. Um, but the skill that they need and the, the professional um, attitudes to do that um, yeah. were, were lacking. Uh, right. Okay, so it's really about um, 
the skills and skills that would include things like critical thinking, uh, mm. problem solving, mm. um, decision making. Um, you know, so it's far broader than, than that. And in fact, the enabling competencies we define in our framework, in other words, the non-technical things, if right. you put it that way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on two broad categories. The first one is professional values and attitudes, and that includes ethics mm. and your ability to apply yourself to um, ethical situations or ethical dilemmas, as we like to refer to it. So it's a thinking process we want to create in people. Right. You know? So when you do something, first think, what are the implications in a sort yeah. of you know, yeah. process way? Um, the second professional value is lifelong learning. I've, mm. I've mentioned that already. Mm. We can't possibly have all the knowledge. Yeah, um, and I think when we had earlier discussions, we talk about perfectionism and people wanting to, to get through every piece I of I know everything, yeah. It's yeah. about knowing and understanding the principles and being able to apply that. And as new knowledge comes to light, know how to acquire that and translate that in whatever professional role you're in once right. you are qualified. Yeah, because if you understand how to use something like that, it yeah. means that when you learn the next thing, because exactly. you know, an IFRA standard is going to change in three, four years' time, there's going to be a new IFRA standard. You're not going to go back to university to have your lecturer yes. tell you what to do with it. Yes. If you can use it, you'll be able to unpack it and interpret it and translate it and figure out what to do with exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. Um, on, on your own, which exactly. you're not going to do if you just remembered what the lecturers no. told you off by no. heart, because no. when IFRS changes, you obsolete. Yes, exactly. And a good example of that is I don't work in a technical role currently. Yeah. I yeah. work in education, really. Yeah. Um, and yet, one of the things I need to do in my role as a senior executive is manage my own financial uh, aspects of the, the pre-qualification process. Yeah. Um, and one of the key things we had to look at a year or two ago was IFRS 15 and the implication the new revenue standard had mm -hmm. on that. Now, I don't deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis, but I was able to pick up the standard yeah. and read it and understand how it should be applied in the context right. of my recognition of exam fees, training contract fees, mm -hmm. and, the, and so on. Yeah. And that is what being a lifelong learner is all about. You have some base knowledge, you're able to go and read about it, um, you know, get advice from somebody else and understand what it is that they're talking about. So that's really, really crucial um, yeah. Yeah. For, for, for us going forward, is that yeah. we're developing people who are lifelong learners. So they're not fixated on, you know, and I know exams drive the behavior of how people learn and how they study, but people need to think beyond, I'm here just to write an exam. Yeah. You are here to be developed into a professional, okay? And professionals <laughs> yeah. require not only that you know what that IFRA standard or the tax legislation or the auditing standard says, but you can apply yourself. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why people struggle a lot with management, accounting, and finance. Mm. Because there are no defined standards and you have to apply yourself <laughs> yeah. by it's applying your different. critical thinking, your logic, very your different. analysis, all of that. So, yeah, you know, I do I agree. I think that that's quite important. Yeah. The third professional value and attitude is, is around citizenship. And that's about understanding diversity um, and the role that accountants have to play. And I like to say it as we need to leave the world in a better place than what we found it. Okay, yeah. so, um, and this is not just about, you know, save the planet, don't use plastic. Um, this is far broader than that. And it really requires us as accountants to deeply question things like um, socioeconomic uh, mm. inequality, you mm. know, how they arise, how they can be uh, fixed. And mm. if we create problem solvers, I really do believe that accountants can help in leaving the world a much better place through, yeah. through um, uh, impacting on things like that. Yeah. So those are the professional. Then there's four enabling competencies. Let me just mention them quickly. We have decision-making acumen, business acumen, digital acumen, and then also relational acumen. I don't think I've spoken much about relational oh, acumen, okay. how important it is 
that we don't, you know, we see the accountant as a whole person and not just as someone who can recite uh, accounting standards. <laughs> you know, they yeah. must have the ability to, um, to relate to other people, manage themselves. We talk about emotional intelligence mm -hmm. and the need for emotional intelligence in how you apply yourself. And those kind of things you start to develop in the academic program, mm. um, but really are given the opportunity to demonstrate that and practice it, if I can call it that, in the training environment. Training, yeah. And that's yeah. why our model is so important to have both of those elements. I so agree. you're not just learning theory, yeah. you must also have the opportunity to apply that theory as well. Yeah, I think it's yeah. very easy because, possibly because the syllabus of each of the subjects is so heavily focused on knowledge, technical, you know, I think it's very difficult for students to see past that and go, my, you know, like psych is interested in my relational skills or my emotional intelligence. There's no exam for that. <laughs> there's no exam. There's no, so it's, you know, the conversations that I have with students that I, but you know, if I can just focus on getting my studies done, then once I'm done with that, you know, then I'll, focus on, on all the rest of the stuff, but we don't, we don't realize how many of these intangible skills we've developed through the stress of studying. You've had to manage your own performance and time management and discipline and deal with disappointment and deal with lecturers and colleagues and peers and friends and whatever. So we underestimate how, one, how important that is when you're a student and two, we underestimate that you are picking up a lot of that stuff consciously or unconsciously while yeah. while you're studying and the yeah. more you're aware of that um and this is something I, I focus on with with my study coaching student the more you're aware of these types of things you can actually reduce a lot of your stress levels as well yeah. because a lot of your emotional stress is coming yes. from something yes. other than the fact that you don't understand accounting <laughs> <laughs> that's not uh, actually the problem no if i may just um yeah. alert to the the 2019 apc results which yes. were really very poor and i know we're going to yes. touch on that a little bit later why are students performing yes. poorly yes but we we've been running a pilot this year with um the repeat students we found um a company and an electronic tool which allows you to do assessments against competencies as okay. opposed to not online and then it scores you and then it points you to um, directed learning so it's really great because it's uh, hyper personalized self-directed learning but one of the areas that the we identified 15 competencies that we wanted to focus on because i mean obviously you can't do everything yeah one of the competencies we focused on was um how students deal with stress yes and right. it was one of the lowest results among yeah. all 15 of areas, you know, so wow. it really is something that students it's a universal if they can manage how they can deal with their stress um, yeah. will do so much better, I think, in the way they perform in their studies. That's very true. And I think we, we've spoken a little bit about this in the past, like part of the stress, students don't really understand where that stress comes from. No. For, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier as well, a lot of that stress comes from your personality type. A lot of that stress comes from the fact that you are a perfectionist. You know, most of my students are perfectionists. Yeah. That, in a way, it's almost like, I'm not sure if the accounting profession attracts a certain type of people or creates a certain type of people. I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. An egg, but I think it's the former. And my students are very, um, you know, very perfectionist, very A-type personality, very worried about getting stuff right. Right is very important. You know, get it be, get being right and finishing are very important values. And if that is your value and you're thrown into, you know, like from third year PGDA, you're thrown into something where you're never going to be able to finish all the knowledge. You, you never see a question again nothing's comfortable, then there's no question that your stress levels are going through the roof because you're like, exactly. nothing prepared me for this. So I think, you know, a lot of the work I do with students is to try and get them, first of all, to understand that the stress is not coming from I'm stupid because that's not what's going on here. You're, you're not understanding that you're working counter to your natural personality and that part of what you need to do is be aware of those traits and how they affect you on a daily basis because being yeah. a perfectionist will affect every single task you do. You know, there's like, it's going to, so students are like, yeah, but even my personality doesn't affect my studying. Like, <laughs> really does. And unfortunately, that kind of stuff is never really explored in no, much detail no, in not. an academic program. But I do yeah. believe that 
students should go above and beyond just attending lectures and handing in the assignments that they need to do. And it's something that I try and encourage my kids to do as well, because mm. learning a doesn't happen in isolation. Okay. So you learn within groups, you know, so mm. doing the projects and that kind of stuff is really, really useful. And you're learning things other than just the technicalities and technical stuff that's in there. You're actually learning how to interact with other people. And that's really what yeah. the job is going to be about yeah. in, into the future. So, you know, I really would encourage students to be aware okay of where they're experiencing difficulties and find ways and really i do think there's a lot of resources out there yes they are on the internet um yeah, yeah. that are free these are not things people have to go mm. and pay for that they can actually do and i think part of the challenge is as a student maybe they don't know where to start looking for some of these things and ways in yeah. which um they yeah. can attract i think for, kind of for most students that i speak to all they're really aware of is a suck at accounting and that's my stress. So when we, you know, when we talk and have the conversation of like, you know, let's take the accounting aside, it's, it's your underlying approach to stuff. For most people have never really had that conversation. So all you really have is whenever I do accounting stuff, I'm left with a sense of stress. So therefore it must be, you know, that's the problem. But it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not that. It, there's, there's a whole bunch more to that. And I'm really glad that you mentioned this because I think it's really important for students to hear that, um, you know, psych is not sitting there going, I expect you to know every IFRS, every section, you know, every law, every, everything. And only then will you be a good CA. <laughs> Cause that's what, that's what my students are sitting going. Like psych expects me to know all of the stuff yeah. and, and uh, I can't. So I think, you know, there was potentially a time where in one or two exams, we have examined like the exception to the exception. Um, mm. And so as a result, the behavior that that draws in students and academics alike, I might add, is I better teach my student every exception every and every day. standard. Yeah, and that absolutely. then adds to the volume. Yeah. So we've really, you know, made a concerted effort um, over the last few years. In fact, we've removed examinable pronouncements yeah. because, it, again, it was driving like, oh, I've got to do all, you know, all 20. Yeah. If you understand the conceptual framework and you understand the key standards, you'll be fine. I promise you. <laughs> and if you know that backwards, you can take that. And then the next part of it is, well, analyzing what has been given to you. So that critical yeah. reading, critical thinking and applying yeah. what you know to what is there. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, um, and, yeah. and, and, you know, for me, that hasn't changed since when I became a CA and when mm. I qualified, I distinctly remember writing an auditing question that I knew absolutely nothing <laughs> about. <laughs> I don't think we've all been past. <laughs> Yeah, we've and all, that, we've all had and that. that's a reality, you know. When yeah. when you go into the exam, you are going to see a question you've never seen before. Yeah. Okay. Face yeah. it, it's fact. Okay. If you have, yeah. well, then fluke or by hook. I mean, that is maybe looks something like, but I promise you, it's still not the same question. Yeah. Be careful. All our questions are original questions, mm. and we think very carefully about what it is we want want to assess. Agreed. And as I say, yeah. we've really tightened up on making sure we're not examining the exceptions. It really, it, it's it, there's no point. It really no, no point. No, no. We no. want to make sure you understand the basics and you can apply yeah, those basics to the facts we have given you in the scenario. Yeah. So everything is case study based, um, whether it's mini case studies in the case of ITC or a larger multidisciplinary case study in the case of APC. Yeah. It's yeah. based on a real life scenario. Um, yeah. and, and the reality is when you are a professional and you are practicing as a chartered accountant, you're gonna come across things that you've never seen before. Absolutely. And that's what we're preparing you for. Yeah. Um, and that is why, you know, the worst thing you can do is, um, I think the word I uh, used or look, when I was preparing for this was people who do loads and loads of questions. I have no objection to that. I think practicing questions is good. But if you're only going to practice them so that you can audit the solution, I call it, audit the solution or the yeah. OR method, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. You're not actually learning anything. You need to yeah. really be understanding uh, the principles that are being uh, examined in, in can you connect it yeah absolutely i i encourage my students to do 
loads and loads and loads of questions because any knowledge that you know that you can't use is a waste of time. That you can't sit, and I say to my students, you can't sit in an exam and go, sorry, I couldn't answer your question, but I promise you I know loads of stuff about deep red tax. Yeah, exactly. let, me, <laughs> let me write exactly. out the standard for you. Nobody exactly. cares. You know? So if you, anything you know, if you know 30% of your stuff, can you use 30% of your yeah. stuff? You don't yeah. need to know 90% of the work to get 40% of the marks. You yeah. should be able to convert anything you know can you use? And therefore, for me, I'm like, you need to start off with questions as early as possible so that you understand how you're going to have to use it. Because if I give you information, you don't know what you're going to use it for. So your brain just files it. I kind of call it the difference between a filing cabinet and a toolbox. You just go, okay, I'll remember that. Okay, I'll remember that. Okay, I'll remember that. But if you understand what it looks like, what you're going to be building, then when you put the information in your head, you're like, oh, I know why we need this. I understand where it goes. Because let's be honest, the stuff in Ephraim doesn't look remotely like the answers to any question. You need to convert it. You need to manipulate it. You need to take it out, move it, apply it. So even if you know the stuff off by heart, or you don't have to. In PGDA, you've got the books on your desk and students are still failing. So that's a bit of a clear indication that technical knowledge is not actually <laughs> the deal breaker. Yeah. Yeah. Not that you've um, got time in the exam. To no, go no, and you're right. Not that you have time. That. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, if you don't, yeah, hmm, shame. Um, so one of the questions that, uh, that, that I'm trying to sort of explain to students is, why on earth all of a sudden in the last few years we have seen a massive increase in discussion style questions in itc obviously and then that flows down through to 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 pgda cta it's not quite a third year yet it's still not quite at third year yet but students really struggle with discussion type questions mostly hope that it's not going to happen to them <laughs> Why the discussion questions? Why aren't you asking them to calculate stuff the way we always have or just disclose stuff? Why? Okay, so just to go back to the previous point, I think in the context of why do you need to do questions, mm. you should see it in the context of um, learning to apply myself in a different scenario every time. So you yeah. mustn't take that question and then try and learn the solution. Right. It yeah. doesn't help. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the reason you're doing questions, so if you think of it that way, the more questions you're doing, the more practice you're getting. The more exposure. Dealing with a question I've never seen before. Right. The more skill. comfortable yeah. you will be in the exam when, well, guess what? You're going to get it's a question. question. Okay. So, totally agree with you. I like, yeah, um, I, like, I talk about it as... My, my students will build databases of solutions. They'll learn the solution for that and that and that. And then in the exam, they want to pick one of their database. And I'm like, that's not what you need to be doing is building the skill of creating an answer from nothing. Yes. And the more times you simulate that process by yes. not looking at the memo before you do the question, by not necessarily revising the thing and then straight away doing a question because that's not how exams work. You know, you don't walk into the exam room and they go, what did you revise yesterday? Oh, you did financial instruments. Here's your financial instrument question. Anything yeah. is possible. Yeah. So the more you simulate that unknown process, yeah. the more you learn Correct. to develop you get problem to it, yeah. solving skills, yeah. Yeah. not the answer to, the, to that the solution. particular question. Absolutely. Because you won't Absolutely. see it again. Yeah. yeah. No, you're 100% right. I just wanted to, to, yeah, to I'm, I'm make glad that point. Yeah. Then I just want to... Um, go back to the comment you made about the fact that all of a sudden we well, are asking all these discussions. <laughs> no, no, no. I know that as a lecturer, but if okay. you as a student have come through, you know, first, second, third year, and then all of a sudden you hit CTA, it's, a, it's yeah. like, it's what it is. It is suddenly for those of us who've been seeing. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I, get, of, I yeah, get it. I get it from that. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, this, we have, you know, I guess since, time began uh, um, you know there's always been a balance of calculation and discussion in, in QE ITC questions um, 
We actually, just so you know, when we're setting the exam, we look very carefully at the balance between calculation and discussion. Yeah. There isn't like a set range, but, you know, we, we like to make sure that, the, you know, there, there's a balance. And balance doesn't imply 50-50, mm. but balance in relation to how we've done it in prior years. So that's why I'm mm. saying I know for sure that this is not a it's new not thing. It's not a sudden thing. No, no, no. That we've no. been doing. Um, in um, the academic program, we obviously as psycho the professional body because we don't deliver the program we have two mechanisms by which we communicate to academics how their programs should be aligned to um and the one is the competency framework um which yeah. sets out the knowledge skills attributes and those are set as you are able to do something so there's always a verb you know understand yeah. use yeah. analyze evaluate yeah. etc yeah. that's how competencies are framed the second mechanism by which we um, help universities to understand you know what we're looking for in the profession is the exam itself mm. and so what i do believe um, and again we do monitor and accredit the university so we engage with them about this all the time that you shouldn't be waiting until PGDA to just suddenly like dump students with, you know, suddenly yeah. there are these discussion yeah. questions. And the same applies to the integration. Mm. And I mean, again, integration between the disciplines, that's something we have been putting in place at RTC for many years now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. and yet the universities still Struggle. insist yeah. on assessing accounting as a course, mm. accounting for, mm. you know, final year mm. and tax and so on. And so, you know, the messaging we continue to engage with universities is on those two things. Mm. One, integrate sooner. Okay. Mm. Obviously not first year because you do still need no, to no, have no. Yes. Yeah. Blocks. So think of it yeah. as a Lego and you put yeah. things on top. Yeah. And then the second one, of course, is the fact that it's not just about calculations. It's about a discussion as well. Why is this important? Because if you look at reporting, okay, so it's measure, measures the calculation possibly, but report, you must be able to clearly articulate to someone what the outcome of um you know the particular financial year is mm. that is not something that you do in numbers you would have to be able to describe it in words mm. um, and the role of the accountant is that i call it the middleman you know because yeah. they've got the financial yeah. expertise right. and they have to talk to people who are not financial and that's mm. why in the apc a lot of uh, times we've actually said explain to x who is a lay person right what yeah. does it mean what does revenue recognition mean what yeah, are don't the use these big words yeah yeah and you so know. that is why and you know we the the need to be able to communicate mm. is more and more important now it's quite interesting because i think as we look to the future one of the things that is going to change and not in that there's going to be less communication verbally and written but that we're going to have to start being able to it's called visualization mm. articulate in a picture okay mm. uh, what you know how things are so that is, some, that's, that is one of those new skills don't ask me how we're going to assess that yet and um, but that's you know when we're talking about shift and new that is the kind of shift and yeah, new. so we're going to be creating infographics because that's what you, you need to be doing when you're reporting you know when you're creating exactly. a presentation to management or whatever the case is exactly. the easiest way is Pie charts, infographics, kind exactly. of. Okay, exactly. Okay, that's interesting. Exactly. Clever. Yeah. I think, you know, part of the problem, and I mean, I, exper I certainly experienced this when I was at school. I became an accountant because I thought I could just do my numbers and balance yes. my trial balance. Yes. This is I where the perfectionism so. comes in, you know. Yeah. I have to balance my trial balance. Yeah. Know? And if I've balanced my trial balance, then all is right with the world. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, you don't know what you don't know. And I think... No. Uh, it's it's going to be really interesting to see whether the profession in the future still attracts the same type of person. But there's no question that the type of person that lands up sitting in the CTA class yeah. is the perfectionist, the fixed mindset, yeah. must get it right, must finish it, highly yeah. values quality over deadlines. And now you check them into an exam where it's a time limitation, limited knowledge, uncertain situation, uncertain problem, unseen, never come across before. And you've got to create something from nothing in a limited space of time. Yeah. So I kind of, when I talk to my students, I'm like, quite frankly, for most of your personalities, the type of person who would pass 
PGDA, you probably wouldn't get along with. <laughs> but <laughs> because, it is possible to change. I am living fact. Okay? Well, I mean, I'm for myself as well, like you, you can choose the behavior. And if you understand what's required, you know, then you can take the blinkers off and go, um, you know, Saika wants me to get deferred tax rights. Like, you know, take the blinkers off and ask yourself, you know, I was looking today, for example, at um, Saika's requirements or objectives of the ITC exam. And so much of it about, you know, is analyze this, you know, being able to criticize that. And you're not going to find prepare a set of financial statements in there. You know, and I, underlying I, skill, I or underlying that, ability, but yeah. that's not in there. No. And that, those statements were written when we first introduced the competency framework. In fact, they probably existed before then, but we've articulated them clearer if you want. Uh, and that was back in 2009. Oh, wow. Okay. So, and that's what I'm saying. For this me, is not new. Yeah, no, no. exam has changed, but what needs to change is academics really do need to help their students see much earlier. Yeah. Okay. That actually, this is the role of an accountant. It's not yeah. sitting in a dark room dealing with numbers. Okay. No. It's, there's a lot of communication involved, be yeah. it written, verbal, you know, or even a calculation, you know, would be mm. part of communication. Mm. Irrespective, you have a job, uh, you know, and a role to play. And I think that is where the academic program often falls short is making sure people understand from the time they enter the program. Yeah. Yes, you need to do these basic blocks, but ultimately this it's is what, what the big picture is going to look like. And yeah. that is where we are headed. Yeah. And keep reminding students so that when they see she suddenly I've got to write 50 pages, you know, mm. um, that it isn't new. They understand why they are actually having yeah. to do that. I think one of the things I say to, to my students as well is that if I want to understand whether you genuinely are comfortable with something and you mm. can work with it, then you need to explain it to me. Yeah. So, you know, if you're just dumping numbers on a page, uh, that's just formulaic, you know, that's pattern driven, that's formulaic. But if I ask you like, do the calculation and tell me how you got there. Explain why you use that number. Yeah. You have to have a different level of comfort and a different level of communication, application, etc. in order to say, well, I used three because of X, Y, Z. And I, I took the four and I multiplied it by 12 because of yeah. X, Y, Z. And, you know, um, a lot of my students, a lot of people email me and they tell me that they struggle with the theory questions. They, they see... They see discussion questions as theory because it's words. So numbers are practical and words are theory. Um, and that, you know, you can see, again, from our perspective, this is old news. But from a student's perspective who's, who's coming up, um, yeah. I know a lot of students, you know, that may be repeating CTA or have been in the system for a while. They used to be able to just ignore the discussion questions and still pass the exam. You know, because it's just like you get into the exam and you're like, now I have to write an essay. <laughs> no time for that. That's not happening. But your mark allocation, you know, you could kind of quietly ignore the 15 mark discussion yeah. question and hope for the best. Yeah. But it's not like that anymore. So I think, no. you know, as it's, as it's shifting, and I, I'm really glad that it's shifting because um, I'm not interested if you can do the same calculation again and again because I can Google that. You know, I don't need you to give me the present value of a calculation because, you know, there's a million and one free templates on Google. I just have to, you know, give me the present value of and I can plug stuff in. So I don't need you to do that for me. I need you to tell me what the tax implications are, whether I should take the loan out, what other implications, what does this mean for my business and other stakeholders? I need you to tell me that. And you can't do that in numbers. You have to you know, this is where this is where the value of of, of the accounting is. So I, I think I, I want to make it really clear to students that discussion type questions aren't going anywhere. No, no they're not. <laughs> they're not going away. Even you imagine not. that you can focus on your calculations and your formats to the exclusion of these skills yeah. and be okay because yeah. sorry. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a difference between you use the words writing an essay, you know, and I um, kind of envisage writing an essay, um, certainly in the tertiary environment, as asking someone some very um, philosophical type, yeah. you know, uh, uh, what is happiness, you know, and then <laughs> I mean, happiness write you know, 4,000 words on what is happiness. You know, that is not the type of discussion, you know, 
No. And this is really important. The facts are in the scenario that's provided. And what we're looking for is that you can read and understand and analyze those facts. And when you are giving your answer, you apply the technical standard and knowledge to Mm. those facts. Connect. Very important. One of the things we see terrible is that students are dumping. Yeah. When they write in the RTC, they write what they think they, so I know this, I need to show you that I know this. Yeah. We don't care. Okay. What we care about is that you've applied what you know this and what to those actual to those actual facts what what i wanted to ask and i think i'm I'm kind of asking this more for clarity for for students than than ourselves potentially is would you say that okay there, there is there is quite a high failure rate for pgda students really struggle with that regardless of what the pass rate is students really struggle with pgda and, and then through to ITC as well, obviously, you know, students struggle with that. Do you think that the reason that they struggle with these exams are because they don't know enough technical work? Like they don't know their financial instruments well enough. They don't know the capital gains. They don't know the details. Do you think that's why they're struggling so badly? You know, when it the marks reason- the ITC, for example, no, sure, are you seeing sure. knowledge gaps? Like, sure. gee, people don't know anything. Is that yeah. why people are failing? I think that the issue of of throughput pass percentages is a complex one. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think there are variations depending on which university you know yeah. you've been at, and yeah. I include undergrad and postgrad in that. And I can assure you that um, many universities actually have a, a really successful or high th- uh, a throughput pass percentage mm. in the PGDA. Yeah. And that could be as a result of good preparation, not only in the postgrad, but also the undergrad. Yeah. You know, so that is one of the factors. I do think that there is a lot of content and academics are, 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 are trying to overload students. You know, we've really tried to pull back on the volume yeah. of content. Yeah. Um, you know, because I do think that that is a, is a contributing factor. Um, but for me, it's not about how much you know, it's about whether you can apply. And again, you know, there are core principles. Um, Mm. And if you understand the basics Mm. and you understand them well enough, you can apply them. Yeah. And Um, I think the important, sorry, the important thing is that you will only be able to apply them when you practice applying them. And that doesn't happen the first time. You don't do it once and then go, okay, I'm sorted. Yeah. Learning to apply something is taking the knowledge using it here you suck at it completely because it's the first time you've done it and you didn't know what to do with it now you go and try another question and you learn from that you go okay i won't do that again let me think about it this way and 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 application is not a once-off process no no and look there's no doubt that you have to still put in a significant amount of hours okay yeah, so yeah. what i call time on task Mm. You know, and I think you, you're very correct when you say you can't just do something once and think that you know it, okay? Yeah. You would probably, through that, only have a very superficial um, knowledge Short and ability term, yeah. to apply. So, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, studying and reading the standard 50 times and summarizing it 50 times is not going to help you anymore, no. okay? You, no. you might need to go back to the standard when you've practiced some questions. Mm. If you see, but hang on, I'm missing something. What am I missing? Right. You know, you might want to go back and check something, but relearning and writing notes of, you know, on the theory is not going to help. Mm. Um, you do need to be able to apply and you're going mm. to need to practice to get to that level of, of application. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I, again, I, I hope this is the first of uh, the first of, of, of more conversations with, uh, with yourself and, and your team so that we can make sure that, students out there have more accurate information and like well not to say that the information that they have is not necessarily accurate but as a typical auditor let's go straight to the source (laughs) the most reliable source of evidence uh, uh, i do i do agree with that and i mean you know when people fail the professional exams um and you ask you know you start asking them they come up with all sorts of reasons and many of them are not factual you know, and so I 100% agree with you in terms of going to the source, yeah, you know, right. you know, yeah. just little things like, you know, how is the exam set? Yeah. 
Mm. You know, I think there's still a mentality out there that Psyche has a set pass rate in mind and that we, that, yes. we um, yeah. adjust that depending on how many CAs are needed in the market. I'll be honest, I've no idea how many CAs are needed in the market, okay? Yeah. My objective is to qualify as many people as possible. Yeah. So, you know, that's a myth, okay, which needs to be debusted, okay, <laughs> because it's wrong. not yeah. true at all. And, and so we can go on, you know, in mm. terms of the marking process um, um, and the adjudication process. I mean, it's all we follow robust, rigorous process. Um, and I think, you know, simply, if students have questions or concern, then, you know, let us rather answer those questions. I'd rather people yeah. got it, as you say, from the source from rather than them guessing yeah. about why and we're not out to get anybody i promise you we're not okay mm. we really well no i think let's let's be clear about one thing before we leave the people that you as well as all the universities are out to get are the people who are using and abusing the online exam process as a method and a way of cheating <laughs> These people not going to help you. Yeah, these people you only are people do yourself that a disservice. You. You only do, you know, if, if and students, the profession. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think you know that's probably another topic for another day in True. itself. True. Around you know, but at the end of the okay. day, students are just fooling themselves because they will still need to write the professional exams and demonstrate their competence in those yeah. assessments. It's a very short term gain. It's a very, very short term gain. I, I personally don't want to share the profession with anybody that decided that they were going to get through the exam by exactly. sending their lecturer a query of whether or not they'll do the tests for them. <laughs> no, please don't, don't do it. All right. Thank you very, very much for your time. We shall, we shall have more chats and um, yeah, I really, I really appreciate all your insights and, uh, and all your input. And I'm going to put some of the links to like the competency framework and the yeah. guidelines to communication and the guidelines and some of the marking, um, the, the yeah, markers comments from yeah. the, the ITC, I find are very interesting yeah. to read through the markers comments of going, this is why yeah. students lost marks. And yeah. fascinatingly, it's not technical knowledge that pops up. No, it's no. the communication, it's the application, it's all of this non-technical stuff. So I'll, I'm going to post those up um, as well. And yeah. if there's anything else that you want me to put a link okay. on, I will Excellent. do it as well. Awesome. Excellent. Great. Thank you.